Welcome to today's webinar, The Urgency of Developing More Women Leaders. For those of you who don't know us, uh, I'm Jack Zenger. My colleague, Joyce Palovitz, will be my partner in presenting today's webinar. Let me begin by just talking about maybe the obvious, and that is this urgent need we have for overall leadership talent. As you see here, a large number of companies, 60%, feel that they're facing leadership shortages that really do impede their progress. Nearly a third of organizations say that developing leaders is their largest single talent issue. And we see the statistics about 10,000 baby boomers retiring every day and the enormous kind of shortage that many organizations are facing for talent. We think that one of the really big solutions is to utilize a great resource that exists in most organizations, which is a large pool of talent. And the reason why we think this is such a, a key issue is that looking at this in a broader national economic perspective, it's estimated that in the United States since the year 1970, that 26% of the growth in our gross domestic product has come from having more women in the workforce. We also know that there are organizational interests. Companies really do need strong leadership. And again, women are a, a huge untapped resource for that. Uh, right now, organizations tend to go out and pirate from each other when they're looking for added talent. And we all know the, the vagaries of that. And finally, in, in thinking about this broader picture, we believe that there's a, a fairness, an equality, a moral issue that says women deserve every bit as much opportunity in organizations as their male counterparts. And that has not always happened. And we particularly think that's important because uh, organizations' survival and success really depends on that. Just further pursuing that point about going out and hiring from the outside, this is an interesting quotation from Kevin Kelly, the CEO of a very respected executive recruiting firm, Hydric and Struggles, who observes here as you read, we found that 40% of executives hired at the senior level are pushed out, fail, or quit within 18 months. Most organizations have found it far more successful to recruit from inside, and that's what we're going to be emphasizing in our discussion today. So let's just take a, a look at our current situation. I, I really like this quotation from Vic Malhotra, a senior partner at McKinsey & Company, who said, for women, the corporate talent pipeline is leaky and blocked. You can see that portrayed here in this graph. When people begin in organizations, when they're newly hired, there's slightly more women than men, 53% to 47%. Then as time goes on and people become promoted to the first level, the supervisory percentage drops for women down to about 37% of the workforce. As they move up to directors and senior managers and vice presidents, the number further declines to about 26%. As you look at the executive committee, the people reporting directly to the CEO, the number drops to about 14%. And today, of the CEOs in the world, and that holds true for North America, about 3% of them are female. As someone observed recently that there are more men CEOs named John than there are women CEOs. And that's a, a very troubling kind of a phenomenon. It isn't changing very much. It's, it hasn't changed dramatically in the past years. Two forces seemingly run counter to each other. As women move higher, they do aspire to more senior positions. But at the same time, there's a, a separate force, which is that aspiration for senior positions generally declines with age. I confess that my own interest in this topic came about 27 years ago when I was doing some work with uh, Tom Peters, who is uh, pictured here on the slide. We were doing some 
executive development programs together, and one day Tom just casually made the statement that he personally believed that women were equally good, if not better, managers, better leaders than men. He made that comment without very much data, and it was his observation, but it really has stuck with me since that time, and we have continued to kind of pursue that question. We did some analysis of a large body of data that we have in our firm, some now 1 million 360-degree feedback instruments pertaining to about 85,000 managers worldwide. In analyzing our data and looking at how women were perceived and how men were perceived, we found some very interesting information that we'll share with you in just a couple of minutes. It was amazing to us how many organizations, how many publications showed interest in that research. Uh, and you see some of them portrayed here on the screen, including the Fox Business Network. And so now what we'd like to do is to turn the, the microphone over to Joyce and have her review with you what did we find as we analyzed all of this data. Thanks, Jack. I guess the first thing we did was we said, well, we've got a very large database of leaders, and we probably have the ability to go in there and see how are they rated. And if we divide them according to gender, what can we discover? So you'll see, as you see here on the slide, we had a sample of well over 50,000 leaders. They were about 64% male, 36% female. They were about three quarters of them located in the United States, but there was a substantial portion, over 25% located outside of the United States. And so we originally asked just a very simple question, who's more effective, women or men? So when we look at the differences between men and women in this very large database, what we found is that women were being rated at just above the 53rd percentile, whereas men were much closer to the 50th percentile. Now, you might not think that's a very big difference, but when we considered the size of the database, this is actually a very significant difference. And Jack, I guess we could have just stopped here if we didn't see this difference. Right. But because we see this difference, it raises some other questions for us. For instance, Jack, you were talking earlier about as we look at higher levels in the organization, the relative presence of women goes down as we go up. In, in the organization. And yet, when we look at their ratings of overall leadership effectiveness, we're seeing women edge out men at both uh, middle manager, senior manager, and even top management positions. So that's kind of remarkable. We're seeing this higher level of leadership effectiveness in women regardless of the levels that they're aspiring to. Well, that raised a question about what are these women doing? What are the behaviors that are causing them to get these higher ratings? Now, a person might think, well, they're probably better at developing people. They're probably better at making sure that collaboration and teamwork is going on. Maybe they're better at interpersonal skills. So we looked at the top 10 behaviors that seem to make women or that do make women more effective. Here's what we found. Look at the very first one. They willingly go above and beyond what needs to be done. And as you look down this list, I'm going to show you 10, but the top five are all about following through on commitments taking on challenging goals, bringing energy and enthusiasm to the team. Until we even get to the sixth position, we don't even get to things like developing others. And we do see in the top 10, to be fair, we see things like looking to stay in touch with the issues and concerns of the work group. But we're also seeing following through on objectives, 
And perhaps most important here, they look for opportunities to get feedback and they make a concerted effort to improve based on the feedback that they're getting. So what's starting to show up is that women are actually very well-rounded as leaders. They seem to be able to combine getting results, following through on commitments, as well as developing others. We want to show you a few other ways that we looked at the data. We have the ability to look at the data by function. And so even when we look at functions that are typically held largely by men, for instance, perhaps facilities management, information technology, safety, we still see women with that edge as well in some of the functions that we think are traditionally more uh, populated by women, such as HR and training. So no matter which function we're looking at, we're seeing this edge. We asked, does it matter who's rating you? Does it matter if a manager is rating a group of leaders? And some of them are men and some are women. What about direct reports? And what we see is that regardless of who's rating the leader, we still see women coming out ahead. Their manager ratings, their peer ratings, their direct report ratings. Now where we did see a difference is in geography. And so if you look at this slide, you'll see at the top of the slide, you're seeing countries where women have an edge over men in terms of how they're rated in their overall leadership effectiveness. But about the middle of this group of countries, you start to see in Ecuador and then China, Brazil, Spain, India, Mexico, men having more of an edge. So we do see a difference in geography. So Jack, we assess 16 differentiating competencies, competencies that, that in your original research with Joe Folkman uh, determine these are, the, these are the competencies that leaders need to possess and to develop some signature strengths in if they're going to be the most effective leaders. So I'm wondering, did it surprise you when we looked at where women scored higher than men on each of the 16 competencies, which is what we're taking a look at here. Boy, women seem to be doing pretty well on a lot of these, don't they? They do. And uh, as you say, most organizations have developed some kind of competency model that they hold out as defining what makes a good leader. It happens that we have a 360-degree feedback instrument that we use probably half the time. And as you look at those 16 competencies that we traditionally measure, uh, what you see is that for 13 of them, women receive higher scores than men. Now, I think to be accurate, we, these, the differences aren't in absolute terms huge. But as you pointed out earlier, they are very statistically significant. One of them is kind of a wash. That's the, the competency of innovation. On a couple of them, the males received, again, just slightly higher, but statistically significantly higher scores than their women counterparts. But the point here is that if organizations are at all concerned about how women will perform and in what areas they will be effective, uh, the data would strongly suggest that they will do quite nicely, thank you. Which leads us kind of to the, to the next slide, which is looking at the overall question of their effectiveness as it pertains to gender and age. And what you see here is that at a very young age, the males start out being perceived as slightly more effective. These are, this is an overall measure of leadership effectiveness. But by the age of uh, 36, uh, they are now kind of uh, equal. And the women now kind of level off and keep on at that level the rest of their careers until they're in their 60s. Whereas note that the male scores tend to decline over years. Uh, that the that their effectiveness is perceived as being about eight points maybe below 
their female counterparts. We found particularly fascinating the question of practices self-development. You mentioned earlier, Joyce, that uh, women are more mm -hmm. inclined to practice self-development than men. And we see this being demonstrated on this chart, that self-development stays pretty close to, together in terms of female and male behavior. But then as you reach the age of 35 or so, uh, the males kind of decline, whereas the women tend to hold at a pretty steady level throughout the rest of their career. They just seem to be, throughout their entire career, more willing to seek feedback, to act on that feedback, and that it makes a huge difference. The next chart is also very interesting, and it's been confirmed by, by others who have looked at this question as well. For reasons that are not totally clear, males tend to be more confident. They are more confident at an earlier age. And as you see here, the, the male levels of confidence when they're very young are quite a bit higher than their female counterparts. But you see that as time progresses, the women become increasingly confident until they pretty much mesh. And at the, at the age of 60, the female levels of confidence are above that of their male counterparts. I've been reading some recent research about the, the, the fact that the human brain uh, is wired differently for females than it is for males. Whether this is the, you know, the brain's structure, whether it's hormonal, whether it's whatever it is, men start out acting and, and having greater self-confidence, but it tends to then level out over time. So the point of today's webinar is not to have this be a contest between women and men. What we've tried to do, though, is to kind of clearly point out that if organizations have any qualms about how women are going to perform in senior positions, they need not worry. And the, the main point that we would like to make in today's discussion is organizations seem to work better when there's a very healthy balance of women and men executives. Those with boards of directors that have both genders are more profitable. Those with leadership teams with both genders are more creative. They're more innovative. And so that's why we are making this webinar kind of focused around the urgent need to develop more women leaders. So there's some implications of this, Joyce, and I'll kind of turn the table yeah. to you to kind of... So yeah, Jack, there are some implications that we want to talk about for all of this research. We see that when people enter the workforce, they're entering the workforce in roughly equal numbers. And even as they kind of move into those early on supervisory positions, men and women are somewhat equal in numbers. Uh, we think that as we start to see these differences in leadership effectiveness in women, it probably has something to do with their desire to continue to learn and, and grow and develop. And actually, that is our one of our main points. We believe that leadership development does need to be a continuous process throughout one's career. And we believe that this gives all leaders a lot of hope. So what, one of the things we thought we would share with everyone today is how do leaders make significant improvement in their leadership effectiveness? So we had a look at 96 leaders where we had scores both from the first time there was a 360 assessment completed on them and then an assessment that occurred 12 to 18 months later. And the interesting thing about these 96 leaders is that they had on average a 30 percentile improvement in their leadership effectiveness. That means that they started at, let's say, the middle ground, 50th percentile, they moved all the way up to almost the top 20% of, of all leaders. So that really does get your attention. What causes that kind of a change? And so I thought we, we might share with our audience some of the things that these leaders did. 
We got nine of them, so there's lots to choose from. One of the first ones was communications. For a lot of people, this is a really, a relatively easy skill to develop. First of all, when you start to improve in your communication, people notice it really quickly. If you develop your, an ability to present more competently or to write more competently, or even just to communicate more often, it's almost an immediate impact that people can start to see. Another one is many, many leaders, by the time they achieve a certain level of technical proficiency, they actually do acquire a lot of knowledge. And the leaders who think about how can I share that knowledge? How can I help others grow with giving them the information that I have is a great way for leaders to improve how they're seeing in terms of their overall leadership effectiveness. The next one is a little bit counterintuitive. It's not necessarily hard to do, but it's probably one that most of us wouldn't think to do. And that's to do something like set stretch goals. Now you might think, well, if I ask for more, is that gonna make me more likable? It seems like it would have the opposite effect. But what our research shows is that when leaders actually set high targets for people, achievable but high targets, their leadership effectiveness scores go up. So, Jack, I, I work for you, and I would encourage you to set more stretch goals for me <laughs> if you'd like. I, boy, I'm going to do that now that you've invited me to. And you do do that. Another one, the fourth one, uh, you know, we get so tied up in our own work lives and the things that we need to get done and, and what's going on in our own organizations. But every once in a while, we need to, to look up and look out and see what's going on in the world. And the leaders who can do that achieve a number of really great things. First of all, they learn new things. So they learn what are competitors doing or what are other organizations doing that might be something we could adopt. The other thing that happens is they bring that outside world into their teams and into their organizations. And so other people learn as well. New ideas happen, innovation happens. Another one, becoming a good role model. I mean, how many of us have worked for a leader who perhaps didn't always follow through on commitments or didn't do what they said they were going to do or did one th said one thing and did another? A very easy thing for leaders to do is to really be responsible as a role model and to be a good example for others. Jack, what are some of the other things we discovered? I've got five. I've covered five of them. <laughs> Would you like to share a few more? I will. I guess as I've been listening to you talk about these, uh, I had a wonderful insight, and that is that maybe this thing we were, that I talked about earlier in terms of males tending to have more self-confidence, which is very easy to morph into arrogance and complacency, may explain, uh -huh. may explain why why women tend to improve more through their careers because they don't start out with such an exuberant self-confidence. And maybe that's a, a tremendous asset that, <laughs> that, that, that they have to, that, that really helps them. A little humility goes a long way, right? <laughs> humility does a lot. So, yeah, the next one I guess I would mention would be that to our, our data showed that the most effective leaders were really good at encouraging new ideas from others. They were very, you know, very comfortable at asking for their colleagues to come forward with ideas. Uh, you know, we, we've all known people in organizations who were the, the classic uh, abominable no man. You know, the, the, just anything you ask them, the answer was always no. Mm. But these leaders that made the dramatic change uh, were quite different from that. They were much more inclined to say yes. And I remember once, you know, meeting, I thought, a really, really effective executive who said, if, if a subordinate comes to me with a request or if a customer comes with a request and I have to say no, I think I've failed. And saying yes and encouraging people to come forward with new ideas is a, a real gift. The seventh thing that we saw happening with these leaders who made dramatic changes was that they were really good at spotting trends and recognizing situations where change was needed. They saw it. They, they didn't have to 
have it, their nose rubbed in it. Yeah, they were, not only were they not resistant, they were out looking for areas where the organization could be improved. And the eighth thing that our data shows quite clearly is that they do practice being inspiring and motivating for others, much more inclined to not just push people, but to pull people. And they were very effective at trying to focus the organization on two or three high priority objectives rather than trying to do everything. And they were really good at making these emotional connections with people that brought the team together, that welded the team into a real unit. And the ninth and and final uh, piece of data that we have on what were those things that tended to change with those leaders who were so effective at bringing about change in their own behavior was that they were very focused on encouraging cooperation rather than competition. We've all been in organizations where there was more competition between departments than there was with our biggest competitor. The most effective leaders and the ones who who brought about this change saw the importance of collaboration, teamwork, this opportunity to cooperate rather than compete. What strikes me about all of these nine is they're not terrifically difficult to kind of bring into your repertoire of leadership. They're common behaviors that can be uh, uncommonly practiced, if you will, aren't they? They are. And and I think that one of the things that uh, that you're about to talk about is, is this fact that does it come to you naturally or does it some, is it something you have to learn? It seems like women come by it more naturally. And why don't you kind of elaborate on that point, Joyce? Perhaps they do. I mean, I, what kind of strikes me in all of this as you start to put it all together and connect the dots is that women are doing some of this, just they do do it naturally. And I think that's for those who are breaking through those obstacles to getting to the top, they are deploying their kind of natural signature strengths. And while we see the differences in the ranks of men and women leaders starting to manifest themselves relatively early in people's careers, I don't think it has to be that way. I think we can start to look at, well, what are some of the causes for fewer women at the top? And of course, a lot of people are looking at this uh, at this particular issue. And uh, some of the things we're seeing is that it's, It's a very complex set of forces. There are cultural, societal norms and values that are part of this, just in the broader culture. And of course, when I say that, I mean, there are a variety of cultures in our world. There's organizational culture and mindset as well. Some organizations are actually creating a different mindset uh, around gender differences. And then finally, you know, women have to take some ownership as well. So we just thought we'd take a look at some of the things we've noticed and to name them, and some of them are going to be a lot harder to solve. So uh, we know that women have traditionally, even working women, have assumed a double burden of responsibility. They, They work. And they do a vast majority of the the family, the activities related to family life, child care and home care and and all of those kinds of of things. We've got cultural discrimination against women in a variety of places in our world, places where women can't drive, for instance. But even in in the West, where we think of ourselves as fairly cognizant of gender differences and our intent is to ensure that there is equity, we are still struggling with things like pay equity and equal opportunities. Truth be told, we hear some things across company cultures. And and Jack, I know you've you've been involved in, in a number of situations where 
very senior level. People were being placed in the organization. You were brought in as a consultant to help them think through. And I would be willing to bet that when you were, when women were some of those candidates, you could have heard some comments like we have on this screen. Well, we can't put a woman in that senior level of a position, or she's not going to stay, or there, we've never had a woman lead that department. I would tell you that my very first leadership role, I was the first woman who had, this was many years ago at a retail store, I was the very first woman who had ever in the 100-year history of that organization held a leadership role. So do, do these comments kind of ring true for some of the things you've heard as you've done your work with organizations? No, oh, absolutely. And, you know, and what you were talking about, you know, it's cultures, all cultures. Uh, I was just in Southeast Asia and you know, there are countries where virtually n there's never a woman in a senior leadership position. And so it's just been true not only, you know, in the Western world, but it's been true everywhere. And it's it's yeah. changing. That The good news is it's changing. We're certainly seeing more pay equality, but there still is not the equality of opportunity given to women in all cultures. Yeah, and we've got a few other things that we can identify it's almost like for most companies, they've got to take this on. There's nothing regulatory-wise that's really forcing change. A lot of women don't have the right role models. Again, I can remember being considered a role model at a firm I was in just because I was one of the few women partners in that firm. Sometimes women don't have sponsors who are actively uh, looking after them and promoting them. And I'm going to say a little bit more about this exclusion from informal networks, but there's a lot of how you rise in an organization culturally that just simply has to do with who's in your network. Well, we don't want to just give people problems. Uh, we want to give people food for thought around solutions. So we thought we would cover a few of the things that we are seeing our clients do that we think helps solve some of this gender diversity issue. One thing is how can companies ensure a fair promotion process and also succession planning that takes into account gender, gender diversity? How do we move from intent to action? So some of the things that we're seeing people do is they require, actually, a number of female candidates for every position that is considered a promotable position or for succession planning. So women need to be included in the mix. And that causes managers and leaders to look a little bit further afield than they might have within their own network, actually. And things like resumes that have no gender identifying information on it. So you can look at a group of people and really just look at their experience. Uh, we can certainly encourage organizations to put women in more challenging assignments. We know that that's one of the behaviors they actually do very well. The most effective women leaders are women who have taken on challenging assignments. And the importance of having a line role, a P&L responsibility. This is part of the pathway to that CEO job. We can encourage senior leaders to spend more time in mentoring and coaching and encourage affinity networks. And number six here is helping women have mixed gender internal networks. Sometimes I wonder if some of the, the really good work that's been done in large organizations around having women network groups, and that's valuable, but if the only people in my network or a large bit of the people in my network are women, I am, as a woman, I'm probably not having a fully expanded network. No, Joyce, I belong to a... A women's Leadership Institute here in, in my, my home state. And what's been fascinating is that they have set as a very high priority that it not be an organization entirely of women, that they needed to have yeah. male members of their board. And what they found is that by having a, a mixed board, they are making much more headway, much more progress. And that, that whole idea of it's the balance that you can create. And when you do that, then in senior executive discussions in various firms, 
the whole dialogue changes. I mean, now it's yeah. a very natural thing that's that's happening, but it, it comes from uh, recognizing the importance of having both together. And it sounds like I think it also comes from not relying purely on the best intentions, but rather to say we need to have practices that actually hold us accountable for placing gender diversity in positions. Uh, so not just not just say it, but actually do it and hold ourselves accountable for it. And it's like anything else, it's it might seem uncomfortable or awkward or strange at first, but as people begin to see the benefit, I think, of having that level of diversity, they'll they'll start to say, well, why didn't we think of this before? I guess a couple of other things here are, you know, just as you just said, Jack, set clear expectations. We're here's the, the kind of firm we want to be or the kind of organization we want to be. And then I would say encourage all leaders, but particularly women, to develop their strengths, to find those areas of signature strength where they can shine. And I feel pretty strongly that it's important that women also take some ownership for this. And the first thing, when I look at all of this data, and it would be my advice to a daughter if I, if I had one, or a, a niece, or anyone coming up professionally, is have some confidence that you're gonna be a good leader because our research suggests that you will, that you've got a lot of skill sets that are gonna serve you well. Ask for exposure to challenging assignments, to p &L responsibilities, don't shy away from those kinds of things. Let people know that you do aspire to leadership. Seek out opportunities and expand the network. Again, as we said a little bit earlier, have a network that includes a variety, a mix of colleagues, male and female. So I guess our message for people to take away here is that we believe this is a serious issue. It's a serious issue because it has economic impact, the impact of corporations and organizations to thrive, and then just purely for ethical reasons, this is the right thing to do. We realize that the causes are complex. They're, this is not a simple thing, and the solutions won't be simple. But we need to start, and we would hope that our research and the information we've provided today is laying the groundwork for organizations to kind of take this on and know with confidence that getting more women into senior level leadership roles is going to serve them well. And for women themselves to take the steps to do it. So one thing we would encourage women to do, all leaders to do, is to begin to understand their strengths, to begin to understand how they can add value to their organizations. And we believe, of course, that one of the best ways to do that is to engage in a 360 assessment process. I find that a lot of times, and this has certainly been true for me, a lot of times women actually for the first time discover the strengths that others see in them. And that allows them to confidently step into leadership roles, knowing that they actually do have what it takes to contribute to their organizations. Can I just insert in that in that that spot that it's also then a, a real a message about how valuable it is to do that early in your career. I mean, we we're, we're see that that women often are slower to kind of reach that level of self confidence that their male counterparts have. If they could have that 360 early in their in their tenure it may really accelerate that gap being closed. Yeah, that's very true. And the sooner you learn about where your strengths are and how you can leverage those strengths in the roles that you're being assigned, the better off you're going to be and the better off the organization's going to be. We hope that if you are a person in an organization who cares about gender diversity in your organization and you would like to encourage more gender diversity, we hope we've given you food for thought. If you have questions, we'd love to chat with you about that. And if you're a female leader and you aspire to higher levels of leadership in your organization, we hope that we've given you confidence to do that. 
we really believe that this is something that will only improve not only our organizations, but our communities and our world. So thank you so much for listening to the webinar today, and we look forward to hearing from you.